Hey guys, let's talk about head injuries. So there's a variety of head injuries and a lot of ways that you can hurt your head, um, you know, including lacerations, trauma, fractures, things like that. And there's obviously a variety of these. You're gonna see a bunch in your book. I'm gonna kind of highlight some of the big ones, the ones that are common and the ones that are deadly, you know, the ones that I've seen a lot of questions and stuff about in, um, you know, a lot of NCLEX practice books and things like that, maybe to hone in and focus on. So we're gonna talk about stuff like basal or skull fractures, epidural and subdural bleeding, um, and also what's called DAI, which is diffuse axonal injury. So let's start with the basilar skull fracture. And if you want to remember, basilar is at the base of the skull. So in other words, a lot of the symptoms are going to kind of be around the base here. Um, and so uh, what one of the first signs that you might notice is that they have a bruising behind their ears. And this is what's called a battle sign. Um, they can also have ear problems. And if you remember, there's two types of um, or, uh, two front, if it's, I should say two functions of the ears. The first is for hearing, um, you know, in order to be able to hear things. And the second is for balance. And so with a uh, basal or skull fracture, they can have problems with both of these. They may have some dizziness, vertigo-like symptoms, and then they can also have hearing loss as well. They can have raccoon eyes, which is the bruising around both eyes. Um, and then they can also be leaking CSF. And so like with these patients, you know, CSF is a clear fluid. So if I see a clear fluid and usually it's gonna be coming out their nose or are coming out their ears. Um, if I see that clear fluid, um, I'm going to test it for glucose. Um, you know, to see as if it's CSF. If it was, if I had a runny nose and it was just boogers coming out, it would not have glucose in it. But if it's CSF, it will be positive for glucose and have a certain glucose within a certain range. Um, but you know what usually happens in these in these traumas is that they're leaking fluid, but it's not clear. It's bloody, so you don't know if it's CSF or not. So how do we test for that? So what we do is what we call a halo sign. So we put on it kind of like this um, picture down here is that we take um, you know uh, you know some of that blood from wherever it's draining from in their ear, their nose, and we put it on a gauze. And what happens is if it is cerebral spinal fluid, um, and there it becomes like an actual on um, the cerebral spinal fluid will separate from the blood. So you'll see the drop of blood and then you'll see kind of a yellow halo start to form around the blood because the CSF is actually going to separate from the blood in that. It's a pretty interesting thing. And so here's kind of a picture. So, um, you know, you kind of have the, um, the blood and then the, uh, what do you call it? Um, the cerebral spinal fluid starts to separate and then it starts to, like it says here on the filter paper or the gauze, um, you start to see that differentiation. So it'll look kind of like, like this, where it looks like there's like red in the middle and then you're going to kind of see this like yellow whitish um, ring forming around the blood. And that's usually your sign that you're leaking cerebral spinal fluid, which definitely is not something you want to do and you want to contact the physician about. So let's talk about concussion. So this is something a lot of people are familiar with. Um, this is a time where, you know, a patient gets usually like hit on the head. There's some sort of head injury. Um, they may or may not lose consciousness. Usually they're going to have amnesia, not really remember what happens, kind of be foggy about the event. They can have a headache and most of their symptoms are pretty short lived, but there is what's called post concussion, uh, concussion syndrome, um, which is about two weeks to two months after the injury where they have a persistence of their symptoms like headache, fatigue, they're going to have personality or behavior changes, memory deficits, changes to cognition, just depending on where their injury was. Most of the time this is self-limiting and you know we just monitor it but we want to monitor for those long-term effects and really watch for any signs of increasing ICP or worsening of their symptoms. So the other head injuries I mentioned there's what's called DAI or diffuse axonal injury and that's um, associated with traumatic brain injuries. Um, and you know, usually if a patient has DAI that shows up on their CAT scan or something like that, um, most of the time they're in a vegetative state. Um, cause this is pretty much saying, cause the axons, you know, are a lot of um, in that area, what um, in the brain, what helps us to send messages to different area of our brain. So when there's an issue with that part of the brain, usually they're gonna really have trouble with basic functions. So most of the time when people have DAI, um, like it's a very diffuse, which means it's all over, that they're not being able to send those signals and, um, you know, do those basic brain functions like everyone else. Um, laceration is like a tearing of brain tissue. There's, you know, in trauma in general, we're going to be monitoring for bleeding um, and concerned about that. And there's also, you know, you can even have bruising on your brain, what's a contusion. And there's what's a coup contra coup injury. Um, and what that is, is that like a blunt force, like let's say I was in a car accident and then like my body goes 
gets flung forward at high impact. Let's say like I slammed into someone, my head, like my whole body is going forward with the um, force of the impact of that. So that my brain's kind of shifting to the front and kind of gets bruised there. And then I get shifted back from the rebound of all the pressure from that impact. And so then my brain hits the back. So it's kind of like I get bruised front to back. Um, and so it's, um, it's a specific injury that's really common in high energy or high impact um, injuries. We also talked that there's two types of bleeding and understanding the difference between these is key because one is more of an emergency and one is more of it can cause problems, but usually, and not that I don't need to do anything about it, but um, usually it's not as concerning as the other. So I always remember the difference between an epidural and a subdural hematoma in that an epidural is you're going to need epi and not necessarily actually you're going to need epi, but like that's not the number one treatment for this or anything like that, but think epi like emergency, like I give epinephrine in an emergency. Um, and so usually what happens in epidural bleeding is it's an arterial bleeding. And so in other words, there's bleeding in my brain and it's coming from an artery. Um, and so what's, what's really commonly noticed in these patients is that they are, uh, they like something happens. Like let's say they get hit over the head with a baseball bat. They are knocked unconscious. Then they wake up and you're like, oh, thank God they're okay. And they're talking to you and they're like, oh yeah, yeah, that hurt. That's crazy. But then they're out again. So you should have this kind of unconscious, conscious, and then unconscious again. And that's usually a sign of that epidural bleeding, um, you know, building up because that um, once that bleeding starts happening rapidly, they lose that consciousness again. Because remember our early signs of increased pressure or problems in our brain or that decreased level of consciousness. There's also what's called a subdural. And I'm thinking of this like submarine or deeper in the brain bleeding. Usually this is venous. Um, so it can be slow and it develops, um, you know, um, it, it, it can be slow, but it, um, it, um, it develops more rapidly over time in some patients. So it really just depends on the patient. Um, but um, again, usually these are more slow chronic bleeds versus like a rapid because it's venous. And remember, venous is not a high pressure system. Um, they may have a headache or a change in level of consciousness. But a lot of times these, you know, are fairly self-limiting where with epidural bleeds, we need to go in and do, you know, like emergent rapid evacuation of that blood um, and take care of it. The subdural symptoms, we can just watch them and kind of see what happens and let them resolve on their own. So general emergency management, if someone has a head injury, we always wanna assume that they have a neck injury. And so we're gonna do C-spine precautions where we immobilize their C-spine or their neck here um, to make sure that they do not fracture or further injure that area. We're going to monitor their ABC. So airway, I wanna assess for a gag reflex. Um, if their GCS or Glasgow coma scale is less than eight, we're going to intubate. So they always say less than eight, intubate. You know, there's a little rhyme for you there. Um, and then with their breathing, um, we're going to administer oxygen, um, you know, to make sure that they're getting adequate oxygen that help with that cerebral perfusion and then circulation. If they're having external bleeding, I want to try to control that. I'm going to monitor their hemodynamics closely um, and look for any signs of bleeding inside, including in their brain. Remember kind of those signs like those hematomas or um, that uh, epidural bleeding and stuff like that that can happen versus the subdural bleeding. Um, and then being cautious with fluid administration, as much as it might be like, hey, their blood pressure is low and I want to drive their blood pressure up, you know, all that extra fluid can also cause more swelling or accumulation in the brain. So um, it's all about the balance. Um, as the nurse, you know, my job pretty much is to do frequent assessments. I'm going to support their ABCs as a whole, and this is all head trauma. Um, I'm going to stabilize any trauma or neck injuries. Um, I want to support an effective CPP and manage their ICP. And it's all about that balance. Again, enough blood pressure to have effective cerebral perfusion, try to decrease some of that resistance um, and overall get adequate flow to my brain. I'm going to assess for any sort of bleeding from the nose or the ears. So that's rhinoreas from the nose, otoreas from the ears. Um, do a craniotomy. Um, the doctor can do that in order to relieve pressure, um, drain some of that fluid or bleeding, evacuate some of that area to decrease some of that pressure. Um, and then, of course, a lot of these patients with their neurological injuries, head trauma may be immobile. So I want to prevent complications of immobility, DVTs, um, atelectasis and pneumonia, contractures and other musculoskeletal issues as well. And then, of course, the, one of the most important things is going to be education. Um, a lot of traumatic brain injuries can be uh, prevented through use of helmet, car seat safety, you know, driver's ed classes. And then for older adults, making sure that they get a fall risk class. Um, or fall risk safety teaching at least. Um, general education to give um, is, you know, for patients to know what are, 
um, the signs and symptoms that they're getting worse. So like, you know, when they go home after a brain injury, if they're having increased drowsiness, because remember that's our early sign of increased ICP or brain issues, um, a stiff neck or worsening headache, nausea, vomiting, and especially what we call projectile, which means I'm not feeling sick at my stomach and then vomiting. I'm just randomly vomiting is usually a bad sign of a neurological problem. Um, and then motor sensory or behavioral changes are usually also signs of complications. I should avoid anything else that's going to make me sleepy or drowsy or could make it where I can't tell if it's my brain injury or if it's, um, you know, the, the substance. So um, like, for example, with alcohol, like if I'm drinking and I have a head injury, I don't know if it's my, uh, the alcohol affecting me or the, um, actual injury. So I want to avoid anything that's going to kind of um, mimic those behaviors. It's another reason why, um, you know, with um, increased ICP, we don't like to give a lot of medication. If we can help it, um, you know, finding that balance, because, you know, if I'm giving someone a lot of medications to keep them calm, even though that helps with their ICP, I don't know what they can do neurologically. And really knowing what their baseline is and being able to get a good neurological assessment is so key for these patients. Um, and then, of course, avoiding heavy machinery, contact sports, and hot baths, anything that's going to um, exacerbate. So the heavy machinery and contact sports obviously can lead to a lot of injury, and the hot baths can cause vasodilation, which can decrease that uh, flow to my brain. So yeah, so this is just kind of a general overview of head injuries. Hopefully, it helped get you started and learning about all the fun that is neurological nursing. See you next time.